is the third um, series of webinars about um, the solutions in high density interconnect. Um, my name is Happy Holden. Um, I've been in this industry for over 55 years, am retired now, but I still uh, continue to um, contribute to the industry and I'm a technical editor in iConnect 007 for the magazines that we put out each month um, and the other books. For those of you that are only tuning into this uh, third webinar, uh, Lucy tells me that the first two webinars um, available um, are, since they've been recorded like we're recording this one, you can uh, go to Sierra Circuits and uh, replay the earlier seminars, uh, as well as, uh, you know, if you signed up for this, then Lucy will be sending you a copy of the overhead presentations. Yes, uh, we will. and uh, you can find the on-demand webinars we did previously on our website under resources, resources, on-demand webinars. And, and let me mention that there are a lot of resources available there at Sierra Circus, not just uh, software solutions to help you on design and other things, but also uh, if you have questions of, about design, you can put them on the forum. And uh, uh, they also have a, a number of books available that you can download for free, which is useful to have in your library. With nothing else, we'll get started. Um, the agenda is um, kind of a short introduction and uh, I'll talk about signal integrity and power integrity advantages with high density interconnect and a little bit of high density interconnect design planning and the awareness of new HDI materials and how it affects power integrity and the power distribution network. Um, these newer processors that you can see here have not only a lot of pins in interconnect, but um, like this one is in the turbo mode, is 280 watts dissipation um, requiring nearly 200 amps at its 3.2 gigahertz clock um, with three memory channels that are DDR6s at 1.6 gigahertz, but only 1.4 <clears throat> volts. Um, and so the power distribution network design affects the high frequency performance of many of today's most advanced chips and the uh, impedance requirements may be calculated using the form of the flow of the, the impedance Z of the power just is equal to the percent ripple times the voltage divided by the current maximum. Um, whereas on this quad core, um, if you're looking for, uh, in a, if you had a need for um, only having a 1% ripple on the 1.4 volt voltage rail at the maximum 200 amp current, uh, you would need a power distribution network impedance of 0 0.007 ohms. Um, if you were able to accept 5% ripple, then it would be uh, 0.035 ohms with that. Um, but um, as we go to smaller and smaller uh, transistor geometries uh, on the most advanced chips, uh, there also there's a need on the band gap to reduce the voltage. So voltage are dropping down to one volt and below one volt, while current is still high. And so this power display impedance is an important uh, requirement on the design for any of the high frequency, high performance boards, um, and it's difficult to maintain. So it's one of the things that we'll address today. The other level is the whole system level interconnect. If you've got a signal going from driver A um, all the way to receiver B, and you have some kind of motherboard, daughter board, backplane type configuration going from A to B, um, with the rise times available um, on the current set of performance chips, um, 
all of these parasitics that you see here in terms of inductances and competences um, are now part of that electrical path from A to B. And with slower rise times, we could ignore all these. And unfortunately today, uh, we can't ignore these parasitics. And, and so, you know, this is many times the essential of signal integrity is managing all of these many parasitics. Um, and that's because as you've heard before, uh, in a, a square wave doesn't really kind of exist uh, in nature. The square wave is made up of many, many fundamental frequencies and harmonics. And as that square wave rise time and fall time drops, um, you know, from one nanosecond to 150 picoseconds or even smaller, um, that then is made up, its harmonic content is made up of all the different frequencies out to 1800 megahertz, if you've seen there. And that then produces all kinds of potential signal integrity issues and problems, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, because we're talking about high density interconnect, um, this is the first microvia board in volume production that, that I found um, uh, up and, and this was uh, produced in 1982. Um, and an interesting thing about HDI is that HDI was not invented due to density. It was invented because in 1982, we had this um, NMOS3 um, chip, which you see in the middle of the figure there. The first time that um, we had a complete 32-bit microprocessor on a single chip. Um, you might know of this as the Pentium, um, since the uh, Pentium um, and Intel was a partner of Hewlett Packard. Um, but the before the Pentium was this, what we call the focus uh, chip. And when we put this on our first printed circuit board uh, and everything and fired it up, it didn't work. Now the chip was working, um, but the system wasn't working. And we discovered much to our problem that this um, three dimensional transistors and the, the NMOS3 architecture we were using uh, produced a successful microprocessor, but it could not drive the inductance of a, a, a through hole, a 13,000 diameter in a 62,000 board, um, the through hole inductance is about 18 nano henrys. Um, nor um, would it drive FR4 material with a dielectric constant of 0 0.008. Um, and because of that, um, the engineers did a back calculation uh, based on some uh, uh, chip test parameters and came back and said that, well, we can only drive a 25 pico Henry via, which happens to be a five mils in diameter and about five mils deep or 125 micron in diameter, 125 micron deep. And that the loss tangent of the material has to be 0 0.0004. Um, in other words, the board has to be built out of PTFE Teflon. Um, and on top of that, um, this NMOS3 is really power hungry. It has the heat dissipation of a nuclear reactor. Um, and so as you can see there, the uh, um, it's put into a cavity and technically bonded to a metal core of this multilayer. Um, and then, um, um, on top of that, since it's going to be gold wire bonded, um, it has to be selectively really pure gold plated for wire bonding. So um, this was, unfortunately, the discovery in 1982. Uh, and so we had to turn around and invent, invent what you see there, thing, which is a, a six layer Teflon multilayer with a metal core selectively gold plated with cavities. Um, 
and uh, laser drilled microvias. So we had to build, we bought a coherent laser, built a uh, X NC table um, to build and make our first laser drill since none were available on the market. Uh, if you wanna know more about this, you can um, go to the internet and you see a Hewlett Packard journal from August, 1983, which highlights um, this computer. Now this is the, during the beginning of surface mount. Um, and so this is all chip on board um, because there was not uh, available at that time um, surface mount components. Now, later HP, um, because of the calculator, um, developed the tab technology and we would take the chips that we had made and use tape automated bonding tab um, um, as, you know, the part of it. Uh, but you can see that uh, the computer memory boards there were all, again, uh, NMOS 3 wire bonded type technology. If I were to send this to a fabricator today, they would no bid it um, and come back and said, well, you know, this is impossible to make. We know we're, you know, we're not even going to try. Um, if it looks a little strange, just because with the light of the photograph, you can see through the Teflon layers. Um, they're relatively thin. Um, and so you're, you're looking down um, at a couple of different layers um, right through the Teflon because it's, you know, it's, it's pure PTFE. It's, there's no glass or anything in reinforcing this. Um, this is kind of like the first close-up of, uh, of this. On right is a memory board. In the middle is the CPU. On the left is the IO drivers um, and peripheral driver boards. Um, at the time, a 32-bit computer like a VAX weighed 1,000 kilos was in a 19-inch rack. This computer weighed less than one kilo uh, and smaller than a child's metal lunch pail. Um, uh, enormously successful and, and powerful computer for its size and time. Um, if you want to know more about this, um, you can go to the HDI handbook, which is available um, uh, at iConnect 07, and you can download this 631 page book. Um, chapter four, which is written by Dr. Eric Bogatin at University of Colorado professor, um, is the author of chapter four, which is the signal integrity, power integrity chapter in, in that book. And so, what I'm talking about today is what was taught to me and written by Dr. Bogatin in the book. And uh, you'll find the chapter in the book much more detailed than what we're gonna cover just in an hour today. So uh, that will, will help you. I advise you um, to down, there's 40 other books in this series, all free. So um, feel free to, um, to see what you want to add to your library. But part of Eric Bogentit's chapter the four, he talks about four families of signal integrity noise. And that is, you know, number one, the signal quality of, of one net in terms of reflections and discontinuities, distortion from an impedance discontinuities, the signal and return path. Um, that's one of the, number one, because that's typically the biggest uh, uh, source of noise. Number two, crosstalk between multiple nets <clears throat> with ideal return paths <clears throat> and without simultaneous switching um, operation noise of, uh, of, you know, caused by number three, which is the rail collapse in the power and ground distribution network um, due to instantaneous demand as things switch uh, and they switch synchronously. And then the last one is um, EMI from components of the system, either internal or external. Uh, now these noise, there's a lot of sources of noise. Uh, this is not a, 
a totally comprehensive list. Um, you need to go to the book and uh, read them. But uh, some of the sources of, no, of noise are components are too far apart. Um, uh, one that I talked about earlier, very fast signal rise times, not the clock, but the rise and fall times of current chips, uh, especially if you happen to have gone through a die shrink in which um, uh, the cost of the chip has been reduced by shrinking it to modern technology geometries, but delays are added, so it still utilizes the same clock. So even though the clock may be slow, if the transistors are turning on and off very fast, then these very fast signal rise times produce all types of noise and other discontinuities that screw up the whole thing. Um, changes in trace width, uh, uh, plane, split planes and via anti-pads on planes, which I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, especially the cutouts in power and ground planes under a BGA um, that may starve the BGA for power or return path. Um, insufficient or, or too many decoupling caps. And uh, you can understand insufficient. What do you mean by too many? Well, I'll show you at the end, um, as you work to make the lower and lower power distribution network impedance lower um, and utilize distributed capacitance, as we'll talk about, um, you may have too many decoupling caps and they form resonant and tank circuits that create noise. And so one of the interesting things that they don't talk about is that employing power and ground planes is definitely great for a high speed, um, but you must remove decoupling caps, you know, or you in many times make things worse, not better. Um, insufficient plane capacities, uh, of course, power rail collapse uh, is a major issue. Uh, excessive stubs, branched or bifurcated traces that provide reflections and uh, improper termination. Um, component lead frames of, of the, your components themselves. Improper impedance massing and, and termination of networks. Um, coupling between signals and very loads and logic families. Um, so many of these are created by the layout of the board, which means that you can simulate the schematic, but until you actually physically design the PC board, um, many of the sources of noise aren't available uh, because they're actually caused by the physical design of, of the printed circuit boards. And that leads to multiple respins and delays. So, you know, some of the things that Eric Bogington helped for me was um, how does the HDI, high density interconnect features, um, solve some of the signal integrity problem? And uh, the biggest one is reduction of noise, reflections, crosstalks, and simultaneous switching, but also. EMI and RFI reductions uh, improve signal propagation, but lower attenuation, and power supply company and reduced impedance. So uh, HDI features, because high density interconnect is really a, an architecture of short interconnect length. In other words, you know, in definition, high density, um, you know, we're going to be doing making things smaller, miniaturize things. Uh, and many of the uh, HDI materials that I'll talk about have low dielectric constant, which improves signal quality and, and reduces crosstalk um, versus a high dielectric constant. But small vias and small features <clears throat> help in terms of switching noise and signal quality, because as I mentioned, why HP used it was, um, it has lower inductive and inductance um, as part of current loop um, can create switching noise. Um, there's via and pads and methods of reducing and making interconnect shorter by utilizing via and pads. Uh, fine lines and thin dielectrics uh, improve crosstalk, reduce switching noise, help eliminate EMI and power coupled to ground that we'll uh, talk about 
um, and why uh, it's essential and can be utilized in high density interconnect constructions. So the 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 big problem here is a thing called the plated through hole. And if you look at a classical plated through hole, um, you know each hole has capacitance and inductance, and uh, and you can see there the example. Uh, with a five inch total interconnect length, you know, what the, uh, you know, the delay and impedance of a particular plated through hole can be, you know, based on its diameter. Um, but also um, the plated through hole will capacitive couple with respect to the planes, the approximately 0.5 picofarads to one and a half picofarads based on geometry. Um, and this means that if you're solving your problem by adding more layers um, and the board gets thicker, um, you're only going to make signal integrity worse of problem. Um, eventually, they're going to have to resort to back drilling and reducing the, uh, the in inductance of the holes and also eliminate its capacitive coupling effect. Um, now there's also capacitive loading in X and Y. Uh, and, you know, thin dielectric layers increase interlayer capacitance, but it lowers it to the ground plane. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, is important um, because in our last webinar, we talked about BGA breakout and routing. Uh, the cleanest, signals are going to be um, a X layer and a Y layer of traces coupled together with a laser drill blind via, not a through hole. That's gonna be your cleanest signal integrity, um, but it's also potentially going to be um, with the right impedance um, of a relatively thin layer um, um, in order to maintain your transmission line. Um, and so one of the, the fundamentals of the book on uh, the HDI handbook is looking at the blind and buried mechanically drilled through holes that are plated and replacing them with micro vias, either uh, uh, between adjacent layers or skip via layers one to three. Um, and this um, is one of the, the, the secrets of uh, making the board cost less um, is taking advantage of the miniaturization of, you know, trying to replace as many of the larger drilled through holes with the smaller laser drilled vias so that you have additional routing space and a lower total inductance for each net in terms of their things. The other advantage, like I said, it, you know, is that the blind via is only going to couple <coughs> to the next adjacent layer, uh, about 0 0.038 picofarads. Um, and so that uh, uh, the rest of the layers um, are now not going to potentially see a through hole uh, to couple the two in terms of distributing noise across the whole network. <coughs> so the problem with through holes, um, one of them is the via hole inductance. And here's an equation for um, the via inductance in nano Henry's uh, as a function of uh, length of the via, that is the thickness of the board and also the diameter of the hole. And uh, unfortunately, um, to make things uh, smaller, to go smaller and smaller diameter, um, not only does that make uh, the inductance go up, but it also makes it more difficult to metallize an electroplate in terms of whole aspect ratio kind of thing. So um, the physics is competing against making boards thicker and 
larger uh, because that just compounds the signal and power integration issues and in, in the design. Um, also stubblets nets, <coughs> it's one thing, but uh, you know, if, like I said, there are uh, stubs on your net and a, a stub can be uh, the through hole that uh, is remaining between um, the various signal layers. And what that does is that that pushes out the waveform uh, uh, to its receiver. Uh, again, a, a source of, of noise in the circuit. Um, here are some actual measurements. Uh, and uh, what you see here is the, uh, the, the pink kind of is a, a long stub, which is the complete uh, through hole. And the uh, blue is a back drilled short stub. And then the red dotted line is a microvia. So at 1.25 gigahertz, two and a half gigahertz and five gigahertz for a, an 062 1.6 millimeter multi-layer. Um, these are the, the uh, dB of noise generated. And on a thicker board, uh, a six millimeter thick uh, back plane or motherboard, you can see that uh, at five gigahertz, the, uh, the through hole is off scale um, in terms of its uh, noise generated compared to the, the microvia. When I talked about via cast versus via planes, um, this is the, what happens to the, the picoferrets as you add copper planes or layers to the board. Um, and this happens to every single through hole on the board. Um, but even worse is that noise can couple from a, a through hole um, to a plane, and then that plane will spread the noise to all the other through holes throughout it. So uh, signal integrity problems uh, based on the noise can many times be extremely difficult to run down um, because it may be just the fact that you know, it's overly complex with too many layers and too many through holes. And you've got to get rid of those through holes. Well, the only way to get rid of the through holes um, is to practice utilizing blind vias or buried vias in the structure, which we talked about at the last webinar. Um, this is one I got from the Europeans, TDR measurement. Um, if you know it's, it's in German, but um, the microvias on this uh, net, uh, they're on the left-hand side. Uh, the transition through the microvias are virtually visible to, on the standard through hole via on the right. You can definitely see uh, the effect that the through holes have on uh, this critical noise on the net. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and that's the, the various methods of, um, of the inductance and the current loop involved in the entire network. EMI is the same way on left-hand side is a conventional um, multi-layer um, where the, spikes exceed the FCC standard. On the right-hand side, utilizing a ground shield flood of layer one, um, which we talked about um, at the last uh, webinar, and I've got a slide coming up, is, a, uh, um, is below the FCC standard because of the use of the uh, flooded ground plane as a Faraday cage in the design. For power supply network impedance, um, you know, these are the classical uh, curves of, you know, power supply components um, and the frequency response. Um, but the big one there at the high frequency uh, 
is the one in which can only be supplied by distributed or buried capacitance, which I want to talk a little bit about. Um, and that is you, you can't solve it just with adding more decoupling capacitors because the decoupling capacitor has inherent inductance and resistance. Um, you've got to go to a, a distributed capacitance power ground layer pair. And, um, and then one of the best ways with the, the fact that um, since microvias typically um, come from the outside in, um, they like to see thin dielectrics and uh, thin HDI dielectrics produce approximately 400 to 20,000 picofarads per square inch um, because they are thin. And so it's the ideal to have as layer two, um, your power plane um, with your uh, ground plane on the surface. And I can show you that um, because of mechanically drilled hole anti-pads, having a ground plane on the surface is actually more copper for the return path than having a ground plane inside the PC board um, um, because of, well, I'll show you later, the, the effect of anti-pads um, on all the through holes that do not connect to that, that particular ground plane um, with it. So um, by reducing the plane separation, this lowers inductance and radiation of the copper plates. Uh, and the microvia significantly reduce the whole barrel inductance by a factor of 12. Um, so external plane of copper foil plus electric plated copper, um, you know, is about two mil thick or so. So power rail collapse is um, the simultaneous switching of outputs in which your, your voltage uh, there in the, the blue uh, drops because of insufficient energy um, to handle the simultaneous switching uh, that uh, hopefully you want to supply with decoupling caps. But, but depending on the speed of that uh, switching, the inductance of the decoupling capacity may lose most of its energy in the inductance inside that. Um, and you've really got to go to power ground pairs in order to supply the energy required. Um, so uh, in this, I've like shown here, um, the blue curve is capacitance as a, a, in terms of picofarads per square inch as a function of dielectric thickness in mills. Um, and on some of the red line, I've switched from an FR4 material to um, high dielectric materials, like the dielectric constant 16, like the 3M material. And then the uh, orange line on the right-hand side is inductance in terms of nanohenries per square. And uh, as the distance, the thickness goes down, it drops to nearly zero. Uh, so, you know, the, the whole point of power ground uh, separation, um, if that can be made as thin as possible or with a depth cut as high as possible, um, then you, you gain um, a, a lot of this capability of storing the energy required for simultaneous switching. So there are, for HDI, a lot of thin materials, FR4. Um, um, these are just so, some of the standard uh, 1067 or you know, 2313, 2116. And then for laser drilling, the uh, spread glass, laser bird materials that are um, uh, more uniform um, because instead of drilling a large hole through it, we're going to laser drill uh, potentially a small, much, much smaller hole. And um, it's important that, um, uh, that we not hit 
just a, a resin rich only area or a glass rich area um, because it's much, much smaller. And then also the fact that um, around the world, most HCI boards, 38% use these laser drillable prepregs. Only 20% use conventional prepregs and 28% resort to resin coated copper RCC. Um, they're shown in the diagram. There can be a, a single pass resin coated copper foil. Um, there can be a dual pass resin coated in which um, there may be a uh, a uh, a uh, a stage of polyimide resin and then epoxy resin B stage, or there may be actually one of these um, extremely fine uh, prepregs embedded in the uh, the resin and and cured. Um, so that these are reinforced resin coated coppers, um, not just straight 100% resin based. So the current di distributed capacitance options, um, what you typically hear about are the expensive ones, you know, these top 12 or so that I've listed here um, uh, with their, their part, part name um, things like that from um, all over the world. And uh, you can see that, you know, they are indeed thin. And if you look at their dielectric constant at one megahertz, um, you can see that, that it's more than just epoxy resins being involved here, but, um, but variation ones. So there's both the nanofarads per square inch or the picofarads per square centimeter available. But I want to highlight the uh, the ones in uh, yellow, and the first one is, you know, a, a three mil core that you can see there. That's a standard material, and uh, uh, and then um, the more proprietary and expensive materials above that. But also there are films available, <coughs> and when you consider HDI prepregs available. And so some of these uh, thin prepregs, you can see there are under two mils thick, um, which carries with them the advantage of higher uh, capacitance uh, and lower inductance because of their thickness. Um, or resin coated foils um, down there as well, um, uh, that may be utilized instead of just a pre to produce an HDI stack up. And so as a reminder, you know, uh, uh, what I have the tendency to design and with is, is uh, putting my return path ground plane on the surface with the SMT components. Um, and then, you uh, know, in layer two, I could have either a, a horizontal vertical sigma one, um, or uh, um, if I wanted to use um, the thing, um, layer two being power and then signal starting on layer three um, with a, uh, a, a type three construction in which um, the signal horizontal signal vertical are layers three and four. Um, and depending on, you know, the stack up in the fabricator and what they're used to working with and whether or not the material could be as thin as 0.2 mils with the 3M or the Oak Mitsui, very capacitance materials that can, uh, that can be used there in the stack up. And what that does is, you know, you know, these different materials um, have different effects on the, the impedance of the power distribution network. Um, these are some of the, the most popular ones that are I've just listed um, and uh, in terms of their effect. And their effect is um, fundamentally part of the physics of either the thickness 
and or their dialectic constant uh, being employed. So the inductance of, of decoupling capacitors, what you're conventionally used to doing is, you know, having this decoupling capacitor up on the surface and um, you've got ground somewhere and power someplace else and the through holes, you know, forming this current loop. Um, now, what is better is have somewhere buried a power ground pair uh, uh, that could be connected with a blind vias, which makes for uh, lower inductance. Um, the best is to have the components and ground on the surface and then having the power um, using a laser drilled one very close by there that, you know, either, you know, one mil to uh, three mils total distance, depending on whether or not um, you're going to use pre-preg resin coated copper foil um, or a, uh, a core uh, in, in terms of producing this. But um, this is illustrated by Eric Bogutin in chapter four in terms of the current loop and some of the sick of waveforms I'll show you a little later. So, you know, consider the role of newer, thinner prepregs with spread glass for uniform dielectrics and uh, resin coated coppers and reinforced resin coated coppers are thinner than prepregs. Um, HDI boards are usually thinner than conventional mufflers, therefore they, they can have a, a lower material cost um, as long as it doesn't become an assembly issue. Uh, boards don't have to be 1.6 millimeters thick. That's just, uh, you know, a, a leverage from the kind of good old days. Um, so distributed capacity reduces power bus noise. These are uh, different distributed capacitance materials um, and the uh, noise on the uh, power bus kind of thing and showing that, <clears throat> well, the, you know, things like the 3MC ply, which has the highest dielectric and the thinnest, uh, you know, has the least amount of noise. And, uh, and the dash line is uh, uh, no power bus, ground power decoupling, but just uh, isolated power and ground layers and decoupling caps. Um, again, power distribution radiation, relative radiation fields in dB as a function of the, the uh, 0.3 mil dielectric, the one mil dielectric and the two mil dielectric on a bare board versus frequency, um, as well as uh, the noise and the power distribution that from another publication um, so I'm simulated peak-to-peak uh, -peak noise in terms of millivolts for uh, product A, which is 50 micron, product B, 25 micron, and product C, 18 micron uh, dielectric. And then noise on the, the power thing from, uh, again, different products in terms of an I diagram uh, in terms of uh, uh, the effect that power ground material can have on, um, on, on your distribution network design. So the high P constraints, you know, the layer stack up um, is important. And so one of the things we've done is um, uh, spent time on, on uh, HDI signal integrity simulation um, in terms of what I've done in the past is um, after placement of parts, picking the most critical uh, net on the board and hand routing that, and then going back and doing a uh, simulation of that net and capturing the uh, performance as constraints and then going back and having uh, the rest of those class of nets routed on particularly um, microvia layer pairs using the constraints. And so what I kind of call this is 
is uh, automation of hand routing. Uh, you're still doing the hand routing, but utilizing the constraint features of modern HDI tools um, and signal integrity simulators, uh, you know, optimizing that one net and then using those constraints and micro via layer pairs to route all the rest of the class and then going on to the next class, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. Um, and th that's because today the uh, signal and power integrity tools have gotten the ability to um, simulate all the parasitics utilized um, in a normal PC board, whereas before we were ignoring those things. And, but, uh, but now we have to take into effect all of these things in order to eliminate ground bunts, ground bounce, and DC drop analysis, and plane residence, and a mixed signal and power integrity analysis for complex models. Um, what this means for the design tools, you have to pay attention to details that we didn't before, especially vias, which used to be modeled simplistically, power ground planes, which used to ignore entirely. And then vias are especially troubling because they can cause high-speed signals to interact with planes. So one of the things we did is um, in 2009, uh, produced a paper for design con in which we took this standard 16 layer through hole uh, PC board, computer board, which was quite common and redesigned it as a 12 layer HDI board. But um, we did different types of HDI boards from a drilled sequential lamination 12 layer to a, uh, a uh, type three staggered HDI board, which was only 10 layers. Um, and then another type three stack HDI board, which was eight layers. And then an ELIC board, um, which was eight layers. Um, and actually built these four different HDI boards, populated them and compared their performance. And so the original is designed with 16 layers with this 940 pin BGA, uh, 498 pin flash memory, uh, one and a half volt power rails split between 1.25, 2.5 and 3.3 volts. Um, and then the 12 layer HDI board, I won't show the, all the other ones, but the first thing is reducing um, the power ground plane separation. So, um, in yellow there is the three mil um, core plane separation and the blue is a five mil. And uh, three mil because it's the cheapest of the standard cores typically available today. But you can see that um, there's an improvement in going from five mils to three mils. Uh, greater than five mil is not much uh, uh, important improvement at all. Uh, and then switching from a, a 1.1 1 .1 by one inch board to a 10 inch by 10 inch board, um, you can see there's a, a little bit of difference uh, in the in in the size of the board and its response. Uh, the other one is switching from the uh, FR4 from the prior one at three mils uh, to this one mil thick um, dielectric constant 16 material, which is the yellow. And you can see shooting for a 0.1 ohm um, power supply impedance, the, uh, the yellow basically meets that goal, whereas the, the three mil you know, doesn't take it on a high frequency. And that's begun because of capacitor parasitics. Um, in mounting capacitance and parasitics. The same thing with you know, mounting inductance that um, can render a cap useless in the long term. Um, and the difference in power integrity um, with um, how the 
vias are placed and some of the effects there. So um, the effect of a 0402.01 microfarad capacitor with the vias at distances of, of uh, zero via and pad to 40 mils to 80 mils. Um, and whether or not it's close, the power is close to the component or on the opposite side of the board. So you can see the difference between the, the VN pad in yellow, uh, 40 mils in green, and the 80 mils in blue um, effect of just the, the distance uh, um, and that current loop. And then uh, the, uh, um, the yellow, which is the uh, uh, power ground closest to the capacitor. Um, the green, the power ground is in the middle of the board and the blue power ground is on the opposite side of the board in terms of, uh, of frequency effect of just the, you know, how big that current loop is on the vias getting to the particular power plate. The other one is the voltage drop. And um, here is a, a 0.8 millimeter pitch BGA with um, mechanically drilled um, holes. Well, like not me using mechanic through holes, but these are anti pads in the power layer at the voltage drop compared to uh, a laser drilled hole. Um, and the difference is um, um, in the voltage drop significant for those two. Um, and that's what we call the Swiss cheese effect, um, because not just the, the current density changing, but also this affects the return path uh, um, and what it sees. And so um, the blue is the, uh, the through hole respect, and then the uh, microvias for the same BGA uh, produced there in the yellow compared to the, the blue. Um, so, like I said, kind of recap, um, and starting at with the, the five mil FR4 uh, in blue and the three mil, then moving up to the uh, three mil FR4 free preg and the 0.8 mil C ply material. And then um, the eight mil C ply material. And then in the uh, Yellow is without 50% of the decoupling caps. And as the last slide, the power to supply impedance for the 3.3 volt, the original design um, uh, you see there in blue uh, had 100.01, 60.1, but went back and removed um, majority of the 0.01s. Uh, three quarters of the point one still had the 12 uh, to end up with the yellow thing. And so one thing that's important is that utilizing the uh, distributed capacitance uh, does reduce the noise, but one of the sources of noise now becomes if you've got too many decoupling the path, like in the blue there, you've got resonant circuits that goes on that if you start pulling out those decoupling caps, not only do you have more room for routing um, and you have to buy less caps, but you can get rid of about 80% of the decoupling caps. Um, and then you end up with that yellow curve there where you, you don't have the effect. And the same thing is true on the 2.5 volt grill. Went from 30.01s to four, from 88.01s to 42, and one 10 microfarad, both of them from the blue to the, the yellow. So kind of in conclusion, you know, references and future reading, um, the HDI handbook is available, but also um, you see here, Sierra Circuits has a 61 page HDI interconnect design guide for blind buried and micro vias that you can download as well as uh, uh, one from Altium, 48 page uh, one from Altium. Uh, and I recommend 
you know, you use and download and read through these things. So I want to thank you for your time and questions can be sent to Lucy and we'll get back with you. But um, um, if you haven't seen the other, the first two webinars, um, they've been recorded. So you can go back and review them because um, you may want to show them to other people or just review what was going on, especially um, if you want to uh, read to the book and the book is more detailed than what we've done on these three hour webinars. Um, so um, good luck with all of you. Hope to see you sometime. Well, with thank you, Happy. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A uh, section. Mm -hmm. Do you see it? Well, uh, I had to stop sharing, I think. Uh, no, that's OK. Just go to the Q&A section. Oh. Yeah, how does, OK, how does HDI compare with VECS? Is VCS considered HDI relative to via characteristics? Um, uh, VCS is um, superior to HDI, but um, VCS dash micro um, util can utilize um, laser drilled VS from one to two as part of breakout. And then the VCS is uh, replaces all the other uh, um, things. So VCS is a true three-dimensional routing capability. Um, so it has um, signal integrity characteristics that you can't get with conventional HDI um, because uh, they have the ability to uh, to shield and plate uh, layer uh, via pairs in terms of very, very high speed routing. Um, so um, um, VCS, as I think, is an evolution um, and goes very well with ultra HDI in terms of finer things. But VCS is is more reliable and is lower cost than many, many layers of HDI. And we covered that in the last webinar, but there are five separate uh, uh, VCS publications available that you can download from I, uh, PCB007 if you want to read more about it. In the book, is always seen more on corners or intersections of the video, though there are, there are many videos. You know why? Sure. Well, I don't know a whole lot about the simulation software. Um, that's kind of a question for Eric Bogatin, um, who knows a, a lot more about this than I do. Um, my electrical engineering degree is in control theory, and I stayed away from fields and um, RF um, because of the mathematical uh, difficulty there. Uh, and my primary degree is in chemical engineering. So I'm really a materials and process guy, more so than an electrical guy, even though, you know, I've been forced into doing circuit design, you know, and board layout. Um, but that, that's a question for uh, probably for someone that, that knows more about the PI simulation. Uh, um, methodologies. Ask me something about control circuits. <laughs> okay, we don't have any more questions. So thank you. Ah, okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Happy, for doing this webinar with us. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I will send you the slides and recording later today. Thank you. Yes, have a great day. Thank you for attending. Good luck out there. Bye. Bye.